All right. Well, it's good to be together. I am Pastor Daniel, pastor here at the McCordsville United Methodist Church, and want to welcome you on Pi Day. Yes. It's all, I just love mentioning that. And, uh, you know, first service, Denny Truex was here, and uh, something that was shared that uh, just cracks me up. He's the only guy I think I've ever went to brex- breakfast with that insisted that we have pie after biscuits and gravy. But uh, it is pie day, so, you know, please, please, if it's at all possible for your health, have some pie today. But it is good to be together. I am Pastor Daniel, pastor here at the McCordsville UMC. Our hope and our prayer is that through this time of worship that you will encounter the Lord, and in that encounter that you will receive and be open to his embrace within your life. We believe that our God is healing, that our God is full of grace, and our God is full of love. And in that embrace, by him, by his Holy Spirit, we get to experience all of that. So our hope, our prayer is as we sing, as we pray, as we hear the word, that we will be receiving his grace, receiving his truth, and receiving his love within our lives. Let's pray together. Lord, this morning we come before you just giving you full reign over our hearts, over us, over everything. Father, we pray that today, that if there's any sort of reluctance within us from receiving your word or receiving you, we pray that your Holy Spirit would do such a work within us that he just washed that away. And in, its, and in its place, that there would just be this openness and this acceptance of your love, God, and of you. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Anybody know a guy named jo- Johnny Cash? Well, that's not me for the record, but uh, we're going to sing one of his songs today. If you'll stand, we'll, we'll get started in some worship. Shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. And he's come to take my name Love is my redeemer Lifted me up from the ground Love is the power Where my freedom song is found There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down When I hear that trumpet sound I'm gonna rise up out of the ground There ain't no grave Hold my body down Oh, fear liar with a smooth and velvet tongue fear is a tyrant he's always telling me to run love is resurrection and love is a trumpet sound oh love is my weapon i'm gonna take my giants down there ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down When I hear that trumpet sound I'm gonna rise up out of the ground Oh, there ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down
between death and life there on a tree the lamb of god was crucified and he went on down to hell and he took back every key he rose up as a liar now he's setting all the captives free there ain't no out of the grave I'm walking to if you walked out of the grave I'm a walking to oh if you walked out of the grave I'm a walking to if you walked out of the grave I'm a walking to hey oh yeah if you walked out of the grave I'm a walking Hey, yeah, if you walked out of the grave, I'm walking to, I'm following Jesus. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking to, hey, yeah, if you walked out of the grave, I'm walking to, oh, there ain't no Enjoyed that. Amen to that. Let's continue our time of worship today by declaring our faith together. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Before you sit down, just take a moment and give a wave to those people around you. We used to talk about meandering about at this point, yes. Yeah, I know, I know, but may have a seat, may have a seat, wave at one another, may have a seat, may have a seat. 
Yes, yes, yes. Well, we do have some strategic concerns I do want to share with you. Some strategic concerns. And they are concerning, according to a good friend of ours. But anyhow, Ad Council will meet tomorrow night at 7 o'clock right here in the sanctuary. If you are part of the Ad Council, we do ask that you make a, a commitment, if at all possible and comfortable, to come out for that. 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary. At least one part of the discussion tomorrow will be our Easter services that are coming up. So we are going to be kind of planning ahead, looking ahead at what we can do uh, in order to, uh, to be able to celebrate Easter and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord together. Another strategic concern is that tonight at 6 o'clock we will continue our Lisa Turkhurst's study around forgiving what you can't forget. Again, tonight, 6 o'clock, from 6 to 6.30, uh, we will have a video lesson from Lisa herself that will be talking about the, the chapters that we had read this week. Uh, and then following from 6.30 and beyond, we will have a time of discussion and we are trying to incorporate folks that are online in that discussion. Uh, so, uh, so we are working on, on that you know, communication with one another. Uh, but, uh, but that is our plan. 6.30 tonight is the discussion. And that is when we will actually go live again. 6.30. 6 o'clock in person, though, is when you will have the video lesson right here within our sanctuary. It's been a powerful uh, study and just... Uh, uh, just thinking about praying through the forgiveness of God within our lives, through our lives. And next week we'll be uh, exploring a little bit further in that. Uh, but, uh, but really, it's an incredible book. If anyone has ever had to deal with uh, the real wrestlings of forgiving another, this is an incredible book. And uh, I can't recommend it enough. Again, Lisa Turkers is the author of that. I don't know of any other strategic concerns. We will be having a good Friday service on Friday before Easter. Um, and that will be 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary as well. And that will also be live streamed. Uh, so you can look forward to that. April 2nd. April 2nd. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, yes. Because her birthday is the day before. Yes. She, would, yes. she has that on the radar. Yes. Indeed. So April 2nd is the Friday where we'll have our good Friday service. And then Easter will be that Sunday. So let's continue in worship. Will you stand with us once again? There we go. All of creation. All of the earth make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint. Let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming.
Jesus come even so come Lord Jesus nothing worth more that could ever come close no thing can compare you're our living hope your presence I've tasted and of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence. nothing worth more that will ever come close no thing can compare you're our living hope your presence and I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord oh Holy Spirit you are welcome come Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, presence, Lord, presence. God, how we love your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory your goodness, Lord.
comfort this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, oh. Let's pray together. Father, we just come before you just here just as we are in the midst of whatever's going on within our hearts and our minds and our lives. And Father, we just pray for just your spirit to bring a calm, a calm deep within. We ask God that you would help us just to fixate our thoughts upon you and in an expectant way to open ourselves, God, to what it is that you're wanting to say to us here today. God, we pray for all those that have come here in this place online, in person, that have walked into these doors, that have clicked online, that just feel heavy and burdened. And God, that they, that we would see how light your yoke is, how good your yoke is, and that we would shed the burdens of the world and take up that mantle of you, Jesus. Lord, we pray that if there's anything within our lives that's keeping us from being able to receive your word and being able to receive your life, that Holy Spirit, that you this very moment would just come in and wash that away. Lord, we pray for all those people in our communities that are struggling with addictions, struggling with mental illnesses and wading through, working through those things. And we just pray for your Holy Spirit to bring some sweet relief bring some freedom into their hearts and their lives. Bring some wholeness through conversations and appointment. And we just ask God that you would work your redemption deep within. Father, for those people that don't know you within our community, we pray that you would just place within us a burning desire to reach out to them. That no matter what, that God, that we would reach out to them in love and in grace and to share with them the hope and the faith that God that we have. We pray, God, that we would be so courageous to move past the fears of rejection or the fears of what someone may think or say when we profess our faith, but that, God, that you would just see, plant within us the, the, the seeing that in doing so, we're fulfilling your word or scattering seed that more and more people may come to life in you, Jesus. And now, Lord, we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're uh, going to continue this journey of looking at uh, aspects of God's forgiveness in and through our lives. And uh, I, 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 I've, I've, this whole journey has been one that, that has been steeped in some, uh, some, some biblical ideas. And, and, and I, just, uh, I, I have been just enthralled in, in, in seeing the directions that conversations have gone, like, you know, following messages, following the Sunday night discussions. And, and, and my hope, my prayer through it all is that we would just, that we would just be a people of, 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 that are streams of God's forgiveness within our lives and through our lives, within our lives, in our communities, in our neighborhoods. Amen. The title of today's message is, uh, Boundaries Aren't So Bad, Are They? <laughs> Lisa Turker says, Remember, forgiveness shouldn't be an open door for people to take advantage of us. It should not be an open door for people to take advantage of us. Forgiveness, rather, releases us from our need for revenge, for retaliation, not our need for boundaries. 
You know, so I'm sure you remember from the last couple of messages, my whole referencing of Carter and his love to build Lego projects and how Luke loves to help by destroying them. Now, what options do you think that we as parents had in actually dealing with that situation? Should we have punished harshly an 11-month-old or a one-year-old child for doing something that they legitimately had no clear understanding of the wrong or of the hurt that they were causing in his brother? Should we have just allowed Luke to continually destroy his older brother's creation? As they say, just let Luke be Luke. Let, let Luke be the Lucanator that he truly is. Or could we have taken Carter's Lego away, right? Because after all, that's what was actually causing the frustration within the home, right? Carter using his imagination and having the gall to play in Luke's area. My answer to each of these possible fixes to the Lucanator and Carter is emphatically, as I know how, to possibly say, no, 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 no. See, the problem that Luke has and playing with his brother is he doesn't understand proper boundaries at the age of one. In his developmental cycle, he's just now figuring out that he has his own space and others around them have their own space. You know, he thinks that the world revolves around him, right? Every time he cries, we come running to his rescue, you know? And, and he's got in his head that whatever he's capable of doing, then that's exactly what he should do. Our cat, Kenzie, has been kind of teaching Luke a little bit about boundaries, though, and how people do have boundaries and pets have boundaries. Luke has this thing where he sees our beautiful Maine Coon cat, and when he sees this cat, he just gleefully runs up and wants to pet her. And when I mean pet, I mean smack, you know, like he has this thing, right? And, and Kenzie has been so incredibly patient with Luke with this. Uh, but, but a few weeks back, uh, he went up gleefully, just excited about being able to smack, pet Kenzie. And Kenzie reared a paw up after the first smack. And she just is like, dare you, buddy. I dare you, buddy. And he did it. Smack. And she... Whoosh, didn't really cause a whole lot of harm. Just a brief little scrape. I think it hurt his pride more than any. But Luke is learning that other people have their space and their boundaries. And Kinsey has kind of helped him learn that a little bit. So what did we do to remedy the situation? Well, we created for Carter a safe boundary, right? A safe area, a safe place for him to play with his Lego. And in the Peyton household, I like to think of it as kind of like Fort Knox in some ways. We have this gating system, right, that protects us and the rest of the house from Luke. You know, it's like, you know, we have a gate that separates the, the living room from the kitchen. Then we have a gate that separates the foyer from the living room. And we have a gate that separates the, uh, the living room from the stairs, all to keep Luke and the house safe. It's, it's both and, right? And so what we decided for, for Carter was that we would allow him to play just beyond these boundaries, these gates, where Luke would not be able to get to him. Now, Luke hasn't been too happy about this, and, and he really does still wrestle with us not allowing him to get into his brother's boundary. And at times, he lets us know very vocally, because Luke is very vocal, how appalled he is that we would not allow him to destroy Carter's Lego projects. But even so, when Carter wants to build, we create for him a safe, uh, fortificated place, fortified place for him to play and to build. You see, boundaries, they're just a part of life and a necessary part of that. Cloud and Townsend in their book, Boundaries, eh, they say it like this. In the physical world, boundaries are easy to see. Fences, signs, walls, and I love that they include this, Moats with alligators. That's a clear boundary. Yes, yes. Manicured lawns and hedges, they're all physical boundaries. In the spiritual world, and I would add the emotional, boundaries are just as real. Absolutely just as real. But often they're harder to see and often they're harder to set. If you live in a neighborhood, it's good to have a clear understanding of the boundary line between you and your neighbor's property, right? I mean, it just makes sense. If you got pups, you got dogs, you know, it's good to have some sort of boundary, you know, for them in your backyard, be it a fence, an invisible fence, uh, you know, a leash, a chain, you know, whatever, to put them out, you know, to, to have time outside. And, and we want these boundaries. Why? You know, to keep them safe, to keep them protected. We as people readily accept the importance of such 
boundaries in our physical lives. But for some reason, are hesitant, for whatever reason, to set up clear and distinguishable boundaries in our spiritual and our emotional lives. Which again doesn't make any sense. If you have no boundaries in place when it comes to, say, eating, well, what's going to happen? You know? I don't think we need to explain that too much. Or, or say if you don't have boundaries in place when it comes to consuming Netflix, right? No responsibilities will be, uh, will be accomplished if you try to beat Netflix. <laughs> or if you, you say you don't have boundaries in the way that you spend your money. Again, what's going to happen? Nothing good. Nothing good. God calls us in our spiritual and our emotional lives to have clear boundaries. Now, we're not going to be able to delve into the boundaries as a whole today. Just there's not even close to enough time. But we will explore the importance and nature of boundaries as they are needed in our lives in dealing with others. And specifically how boundaries and forgiveness can go hand in hand. Which brings us to this morning's main passage. And this is Romans chapter 12. It's verses 17 through 21. I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's word here. Love these words. Kind of intense at the end, but here we go. Repay no one for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, Paul says, live peaceably with all. He says, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. In verse 20, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. (laughs) That sounds kind. Uh, Moving on. Do not be overcome by evil. But I love this. He says, overcome evil with good. With good. Let's pray. Jesus, we ask as in this continued time of preaching and teaching, that every single word that is spoken from my mouth and every thought that we have are straight from your heart. We pray that today that you would teach us, that you would shape us, that you would mold us, that you would form us. And all God's people said, amen. May be seated. May be seated. According to Cloud and Townsend in the book Boundaries and Biblically God, our deepest need as people is to belong, is to be in a relationship, is to have a spiritual and an emotional home. The very nature of God is to be in relationship. For what does 1 John 4, 16 say? God is love. And love means relationship. The caring, committed connection of one individual to another. And again, this is our most basic and our deepest need within our lives. I believe the master creator, God, and his creation of humanity... His most prized creation, as he's revealed in his word over and over. It's more prized in the earth and more prized in all the galaxies in the universe. He created us at our core for the need, for the drive to have genuine, actual, non-surface level relationships. I believe the reason that he created us with the ability to choose, to have free choice, was so that we truly could have the ability to love others. That is, to actually be in real relationships with other people. Where we're not just putting on facades, where we're not just playing tricks, where we're not just, you know, having those surface level conversation about the weather and who knows what else. But where we can actually be engaged in real life, real meaningful relationships where people experience life together. An ultimate relationship of this nature is, of course... Between us and God. I mean, think about it. Can you think of anything more splendid? Can you think of anything better than spending time with someone that you love and that genuinely loves you back? Can you think of anything that even remotely compares to that kind of time spent? I mean, seeing your favorite band, you know, as much as I and Corey like to watch bands, you know, it doesn't compare. You know, spending time alone, fiddling with a hobby, no. And as good as a good book can be, still it doesn't get to that place. There's nothing more fulfilling than giving love and having that love reciprocated back to you. 
It's part of the Creator's design. It's how God has wired us. It's how God has made us. Cloud and Townsend, they shed some light on what all happens in this beautiful exchange when they said this. Our loving heart, like our physical one, needs an inflow as well as an outflow of, blood, of lifeblood. And like its physical counterpart, our heart is a muscle. It's a trust muscle. This trust muscle needs, and I add, and longs to be used and to be exercised. You know, over this last weekend, we spent a couple days redoing the floors in the, the parsonage. And I can honestly say that I have not exercised the muscles needed to do so. And I can also say I can feel that reality very well today. But this is the same concept that they're talking about here with our hearts. When we are exercising this trust muscle, this love muscle, this heart muscle within, it becomes stronger. It becomes stronger. And with it comes a greater ability for us to love others. Say it like this, as we are loving others, our hearts and our capacity to love grows. And so when we're in a loving relationship, where reciprocal love is being exchanged between two friends. This isn't, you know, I'm not just thinking spouses, but also spouses. Or two significant others or two family members. Our capacity to love them grows as we continually love. This is a way of training us, notice this, to love other people. Even outside of that particular relationship. Where that love is being shared and reciprocated. Again, this is all part of the design. But when we are shut off to love, then our hearts grow weak. Right? And the capacity to love shrinks in that weakness. And we even say implodes even within that weakness. Ah, yes, one of the most wonderful things to experience on earth is love shared between two people. You and a neighbor, you and a friend, you and a spouse, and the pinnacle between you and God. But notice this, but one of the worst experiences to ever live through upon this earth is when the sacred bounds of love that you have for another is broken, is smashed, or is mishandled. One of the absolute worst feelings to ever live through is when the love that you have shared vulnerably with another person isn't reciprocated, but is selfishly received or betrayed, or stomped upon. Maybe you're exercising your heart, your love muscle, as much as you know how, and, and all that person does is selfishly lap up your love and never even gives a hint of that love in return. That's heartbreaking. It goes against the very nature of how we have been built as people internally. Or if someone you've been in a loving relationship with becomes of a series of bad decisions or being influenced by the enemy or demonic thought or even gets swayed by popular destructive norms, well, they go against your trust and breaks that sacred bond between you. It's, again, words cannot depict the amount of pain and the depth of that pain that can be caused within our hearts. As Lisa says, and I think this is a great way of putting it, she says, the more deeply I am invested in someone, the more their choices affect me. The more their choices affect me, the more the bad decisions cost me emotionally, physically, mentally, and we'll get to this a little bit later, and financially. Hmm. The more we open ourselves up to love another, say it like this, the more vulnerable we make ourselves to that person. C.S. Lewis says, anytime there is love, anytime we love, we are making ourselves vulnerable. And he's right. The more we love, the more we open ourselves up to truly loving another person. This is very true. We are also opening ourselves up to being truly hurt, harmed even by the person that we are opening our lives to love. But here's the deal. Going through life with no love in our hearts for another, going through life not willing to make ourselves vulnerable, to truly love another person in order that we don't get hurt, is no way to live at all. That is complete and absolute misery. 
because it goes against the design that God has designed us as people. I would rather live my life with real wounds, even scars, right? Because I have loved, than live my life with no wounds at all. Love is and always will be worth it. But I definitely have gotten ahead of myself. <laughs> so if we've been genuinely hurt in a relationship before, and how many people would admit that? How many people have genuinely been hurt in a relationship before, right? By a friend, by a spouse, you know, a neighbor, a family member. Yeah, we, let's go on and on. What options do we have as people to deal with that hurt, to handle that offense, to, to handle that sin, that wrong, that evil, maybe? Well, first of all, we could go against what Paul tells us in Romans 12. And I will say, anytime we decide to intentionally go against God's word, that's just thin ice and probably won't end well. But he says this, repay no one evil for evil, right? But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, you know? And then in this other verse, we could spend some time unpacking this, but won't today. But he says, but never avenge yourselves, that part we will, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. As we've already explored in some previous messages and Sunday nights, unforgiveness as expressed through a desire for retaliation or desire for re revenge is, and hear me, is never a good move. Not just because it is us taking matters into our own hands and very well could make the stinking situation that much more stinky, right? Stir the pot and release the smell. But it goes against the very teachings the very teachings and the way of life that he shared to tell us that this is the way of our Lord. It is completely against what he has shared. It goes against the way that Jesus has taught us with both his words and his deeds, his life. Jesus on the cross, what did he say? Forgive them, they know not what they've done. He didn't say smite them for you know, what they have done. He didn't retaliate. But he prayed that God would forgive them. His father would forgive them. We say, like, you can't expect to take up such a hate-filled banner of retaliation and revenge and harbor that within your heart and then at the same time be a person that expects to be able to fulfill the example and the call upon our lives as Christians to love. It, 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 they don't mingle. Revenge and retaliation are not to be a part of God's upside-down kingdom. These principles that we've talked about in these last weeks, they're absolutely against what we would naturally lean towards, you know, and, and, and would even be against like cultural norms because God's kingdom is always and always will be an upside down kingdom that thinks about life in a completely different way than the world. Even so, we, we, we aren't called by Christ, right, to be a people living offended. That's, that's not the call. We aren't, aren't called by Christ to be a people who carry about within us grudges and resentments because all that tarnishes our witness. All that causes us incapable of actually loving other people. It's like a poison that kills love within us. All that stuff works at weakening our hearts and then therefore weakening our ability to love. All that again is poison that keeps us from truly being able to be those loving people you know, within our lives and to others. It causes us to live our lives as, 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 as I would say, spewing shrapnel into those that have done nothing wrong to us. But because of that hurt, that shrapnel just keeps on coming forth. So, revenge, retaliation, it's not a good move. Second option, and re responding to being hurt or truly hurt, harmed, deeply wounded by another is that in response to that hurt, we could just say, pooey on love. <laughs> in so doing, we would erect with the bricks of the hurt, the memories of the hurt, the pain of the hurt, erect walls around our lives to protect us from ever being hurt again. And I get these wounds, when they've really been inflicted by someone we truly love, they run deep, but God's grace can go much deeper. But these walls... They do us no good because all of this does is keep both the good and the bad out. Yes, it does keep people from ever getting so close to us to hurt us again. And yes, we could live out our days 
without ever being injured by another, with these thick old walls around our hearts and our lives. But these walls, they also shield us. And notice this, from the love that God so desires to share with us. And, and these walls, they also shield us from the love that other family members, or the other friends, or our spouse, or are tempting to kindly and in our best interest share with us as well. But this isn't all walls do. They, they, they trap the good and the bad within us as well. All that hurt that the other person caused by their deed, by the words, and breaking your trust, when these walls are how we will live, well, that stays. It stays here. All the emotional trauma that the other person had caused within you, that sticks too. All that unforgiveness that rages through you like a forest fire, keeping you from ever truly being able to be you because you live in life, constantly have to deal with these wounds, it stays. As well as all that love that you by God were created to give, it stays trapped behind these walls. And the true you, the other people could find so incredibly loving, stays hidden from view. Where people aren't given the true opportunity to see you. And then therefore, the true opportunity to actually love you. Now, Lumineers, uh, they have a song that I mentioned before. And there's this verse that I really like that kind of captures, it captures this idea really well. It says, all around your island, there's a barricade. It keeps out the danger and it holds in the pain. It's a life of misery that we as people attempt to live hiding behind walls erected by hurt. It would be again, like they said, akin to living on an island all alone. With no one to share life with. With no one to share your love or even your hurts with. Because healing can come in sharing your hurts with other people. In conversation, God's grace can enter in and heal. It keeps you. From that fundamental core of who you are. Someone is designed to be in genuine relationships. Living on an island just keeps you from being able to be who God intended. And who he calls. Literally live barricaded within your own hurt. When you answer the hurt caused by others with walls. You know this makes me think of old Tom Hanks movie. Uh, Castaway. You might remember this movie. It's been a while. You know 20 years. Isn't that crazy almost? It's like. Yeah. But uh, interesting movie right? Uh, Tom Hanks' his character, he worked for uh, FedEx, uh, and around the Christmas holiday, he gets a call that he and his uh, specialties that he has were needed in Malaysia. Only in flight uh, was his uh, flight to go down in an act of desperation. You know, it was saved by an inflatable raft. Only to then find himself stranded upon an island for four years. Remember the loneliness that he dealt with? His only companion was a volleyball named, you might remember. Wilson, yes, yes, yes. And you remember the desperation he lived, right? And wanting to just get back to the love of his life. But he's stuck on this island, and so there's no way of them being together, right? Just, ugh. And you remember how he attempted to signal a passing boat, only to no avail, and with it, his hopes completely dashed, you know, that he would get, get, get home. But then he makes a raft. I believe it was out of an outhouse thing. <laughs> but desperate times, desperate measures, right? Uh, but he makes a raft, and he gets back home. The raft for us in our hurt, the raft for us to get off these lonely islands, our secluded islands that we're living to stay protected from all harm, well, it's exactly what we've been talking about in this entire series. It's the forgiveness of God. Allowing God's forgiveness to so be shared through us that we forgive those people that hurt us. And that's how we get off this raft of this to get off this lonely island and onto this raft to back to live in our lives. It's being willing to forgive them. N.T. Wright talks about us forgiving others as us just taking a, a teaspoonful of that forgiveness that God has given us and handing it to another. It's a teaspoon, you know? It's just a bit. Or think of it like this, the wrecking ball that can crush the walls that in your hurt and desperation that you erected to keep any more hurt out. It's the same. It's forgiveness. It literally causes the walls that you built to come crumbling down, to melt down into nothingness, which then exposes your heart to not more pain. See, that's the lie. You know, that's the lie that we hide behind the, the wall. Then we're because there's someone that can protect your heart much better than a wall, a man-made wall that we built in our lives. And that's God. 
And when those walls come down, then it exposes our heart to his healing and his grace. And in that, he can cradle our hearts. And he can protect our hearts. He can protect us from more and more pain. Which leads us to the how. To our third option of how to handle the hurt and the pain that someone else has caused in your life. Again, to intentionally forgive them. And remember, this isn't, you know, let them off the hook. Forgiveness, if you have to forgive someone, you're saying they have done you wrong and they hurt you. But it's to forgive them, and then as needed, by God's Holy Spirit in your life, build breathable boundaries in and around your life. As Lisa says, the first direction is we can draw appropriate boundaries. It's not to shut people out, but rather to shield ourselves, and I love how she says this, from the consequences of their hurtful behaviors affecting us more than them. Appropriate boundaries is a very important tidbit she shares here. If someone were to say an unkind word to you, that's one thing. And you may need to approach conversations with that person again, ready, boundaries in place, for them to be a bit insensitive. But this sort of boundary is in no way the same sort of boundary that you would need to lovingly, by the grace of God, place around your life for someone that repeatedly breaks and abuses your trust. The severity of the hurt, the depth of the wound, for very well can and does, many times, indicate the sort of boundary that you need to draw up by the grace of God within your life. If someone's going to treat you that way, boundaries needed. This is a messy topic, and we, there's so many nuances of it that we could literally spend months and months and months discussing it. And again, there's just so many directions that we can go. But it all depends, again, upon the hurt that has been inflicted. The boundaries could be different for the family of origin to our friends. The boundaries needed could be different from our friends to our spouse. The boundaries needed, you know, sometimes are permanent. And sometimes by the grace of God and the wisdom of God, we need to know when to relinquish those boundaries. And then there's times in our lives when we need to fortify the boundaries because they weren't good enough to really protect. And if you want to explore all the nuances of this, Cloud and Townsend's book, Boundaries, in 370 pages, lays it out really well. But for us today, and what we've thus shared, boundaries give us a safe place within our own lives to mend and to become more than just okay. So many of us just get so used to living just okay. And these boundaries allow us to heal and to become whole so that we can live more than that. For boundaries allow us the time and space to receive the grace needed to forgive the people a person has wronged us. Thus they allow us to let the pain out. And in the pain's place where the wound still resides, boundaries are breathable enough to allow God's redemptive grace in to stitch us back together and to make us whole again. Boundaries also allow us to be ourselves, for they add to our lives a much-needed envelope of protection. Boundaries allow us to be who we are and to not have to put on some fancy facade and trick those around us with some sort of bag of tricks that we put up as a personality. The boundaries allow us to be ourselves openly and thoroughly shielded while in relationship with others, protecting us when life strikes, when they may or may not have intended, but still in the same hurt us in that relationship. It allows us to live whole. All of this is a way for us to do as Paul said. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live, pe live peaceably with all. Just as Carter needs boundaries to be able to play in peace from the Lucanator, so we need boundaries to keep us at peace in the midst of living our lives as we're navigating the beauty and the complexity of relationships. So in closing, let's actually put some just brief meat to what this actually looks like. What do these boundaries look like? Cloud and Townsend, in their book, share many. And here's just a brief summary. A boundary that we can all express, that we can all, by God's grace, you know, put within our lives, is simply the ability to say this very powerful word. No. Say this word to me. This is a really good word. Like, I, like I, I, you know, one-year-olds get it really well, you know, then we forget it, right? Uh, but but, but a, a boundary that we can have in our lives that protects us and shields us and allows us to be the person that God calls us to be is being willing to say it. Say it with me. No, no. 
Here's another one. Limiting the time that you allow yourself to spend with them. You know, sometimes we can guilt ourselves into thinking that we must spend the whole day with them or whatever, or else they're going to be hurt. or what. I mean, again, limiting that time is a way for you to heal up and to be who God wants you to be. Putting some geographical distance between you and them. If the relationship is that toxic, sometimes you need literal space. This is one of my favorites in studying this. A boundary that we all at times could need in our lives is allowing your loved one to actually reap the consequences of their actions. So many times we get the Superman mentality where we swoop in and take the consequences from them, right? And initially when I thought about this, I was like, doesn't this go against the cross? But then I was thinking, you know, the cross brings forgiveness in our lives. But there's many times when we sin, we do reap the consequences of that sin. And God allows that. And it's a good lesson and it's a good teacher, <laughs> But when we swoop in and save them from their consequences, we're enabling their behavior and we're not helping them and we're not loving them at all. Here's another one. Severing a relationship when they repeatedly abuse or use you. I mean, seriously. If you see someone using and abusing you, it's like, I mean, God doesn't call you to live in that kind of pain, that kind of torment. Here's another one. Being courageous enough to not live life as a rug. Learning that it's okay and right for you to stand up for yourself in that relationship or in that workplace. Putting a limit to how much you are willing to help them financially. Recognizing that until they truly change, until their lives are truly transformed by Christ, until you actually see fruit of repentance within their life, that you're just not going to be able to be as close to them as you want. Another, putting some emotional distance between you and them. May not even have to be geographical. And last, but definitely not least, realizing you cannot change them no matter how hard you try. So often we want our loved ones to live better lives and we want to see the change. We want to see the maturity. We want to see growth. But we can't be the ones that do it. They have got to come to a point in their life where they recognize that the brokenness of their life cannot continue as is, and they have to make the decision to change. We always keep that door open, yes, in this context, to them, or where we can help them. But when we try harder to change their life than they're trying, it's completely upside down and not a good way. And know that it is not unloving and it is not you being selfish when God leads you to place boundaries and direct boundaries in your life. No. It's you with God creating a life where you'll be able to become and be openly all that God has created you to be. When you live your life perpetually wounded, you're unable to live your life to its full potential. Boundaries protect and allow you to be you, to be the you. That he, that he's created you to be. Will you stand with us one last time? I was buried beneath by shame.
into your glorious day. That was just clear. Ah, enough of my randomness. It's good to be together. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for allowing us to gather into this place and just to be ourselves with you. We pray, God, that in the midst of this time, that God, that you have done that work of transformation. But Father, we pray that as we leave here, that you would continually, day by day, have us upon your potter's wheel and to mold and to shape us into the people that you know we could be. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Stay hopeful. See you next time. Be safe.